The aliveness inside you, does it hate anyone? Or is hatred a thought that your aliveness can see? What is spirituality? Have a think. Everyone talks about it. Any ideas? What is spirituality? First thing that pops into your head. Self-awareness. Self-awareness, good. Connection. What was the word that we heard? Calmness. Feelings. Cultivation of the heart, like that. Truth. Meditation, okay. So these are the kinds of things that we hear about. Yeah, I call these buzzwords. Yep. Mindfulness, meditation, spiritual path, going on a journey. You guys hear about these things, chakras, third eye, yoga, all these sorts of things, yeah? Energy, we talked about energy, didn't we? Okay, what do all of these things mean? I tell you what all of these things mean. The reason that everyone's talking about it, it means that people are starting to ask a lot more questions these days. People are looking, people are searching, people want to know what the answers are. And the reason people are looking is because people are not happy with the way life is at the moment. Everyone knows intrinsically there's got to be something more. There's got to be more to life. So I want to share with you my own journey. When I was a little boy, my parents always wanted to me, me to be a dentist. I grew up my whole life. Everyone said to me, what are you going to be? I'm going to be a dentist. I don't know why, but I'm going to be a dentist. Apparently, that's a good thing to be. I'm not a dentist. <laughs> but I went throughout my education with that in mind. It all came crashing down when I failed all of my A-levels. I'm like, you're not going to be a dentist with these A-levels, right? And then I went into u university. This was around the time, sort of 99, uh, 2000. The big thing was, was IT, computers. The kind of things that people were saying to me was, you get a degree in computer science, guaranteed job for life, guaranteed. So I did that. I was like, yeah, sounds good. And I quite like the whole computers thing. I love being in front of a screen. I like the technology. It was good. So I went to school, got my degree, and something strange happened after my degree. Within a month of graduating, I got a job. That doesn't sound so strange, but I'll tell you why it's strange. I'll tell you why it's strange. I got a job even though not a single person told me go get a job. Not my mom, not my dad, not my sister. Nobody actually said to me, you graduated, now go look for a job. Nobody said it. But straight away, I knew I've graduated, I've got to get a job. Why was that? Because I went my whole life planning for the next thing. Think about what, what you do in school. When you're in school, you know that the next exam is the most important thing, the end of year exams. And then you get your GCSEs, you're working towards something. And the reason you do your GCSEs and you get good grades is so that you can sit the A-levels that you want to sit. I don't know if they do, do they still do A-levels? It is, it keeps changing, I don't know anymore, right? And then you do the A-levels, but there's only one reason why I did the A-levels, to get into the university. And there's only one reason why I did the whole university thing, because somebody said to me, job for life. Guaranteed good income. So straight away I went into the job. Within a month of graduating, I was sitting in behind an IT desk. I was, had a job. Within six months of graduating and getting that IT job, I was married. Within a week of getting married, we moved into our first house. Nobody had told me to do any of these things. Every single step had already been somehow mapped into my brain. I don't know why, but I had a job and I was like, eh, time to get married, got married. By the way, I married a dentist. <laughs> so it's kind of like, 
I got what I, what I wanted to in the end. Completely true story. And then I got a couple of years into our marriage. What comes next? Children. And that's where it hit me. At that point, something hit me because you know what? I didn't know what the next step was. For the first time in my life, I didn't know what the next thing was. I was like, you got a job, I got a house, got a wife, got two kids. And then I was like, oh, what's, what's, what's the next one? You know what the next one I could think of? Retirement. <laughs> that was the only thing I could think of, right? So I was like, oh, I'm just supposed to do this now for the next, I lived the first 30 years of my life chasing something trying to get somewhere, trying to move towards one goal or the other or the other. And when I'd got all of the goals, I was stuck. And the only thing I could do is then figure out, oh, none of those things bought me the happiness that I thought they would bring me. Because why do you have, why do you have an education? To get a good job, because you get a good job, you're gonna get good money. I had the good money. I bought a house and we had a very comfortable life, driving nice cars and we had everything. Perfect life, going on lots of holidays, had the kids. Like, why did I get married? Think about it for a moment. I had a great job. There was something inside me said, yeah, but I want to share my life with someone. I want to do something with it. Yeah, I want to be with someone. So I'm buying my happiness. I'm just accumulating the next happiness, the next happiness. And what happens is the next happiness comes, it gives you happiness, and then it fades after a while. And so after getting the really good job and getting good money, I was like, let's get married. I got married, got a house. Yeah, we'll be happy. I don't want to live with my parents. I'm going to live my own house. Got into our own house. We're like, oh, this house stuff is quite hard. You've got to do everything, right? And then that didn't give me the happiness. And then we were married, and sure, that was a great happiness for a long time, but after a while it was like, okay, this is normal. Let's have some kids. Have your first kid, and I thought, I was much happier without the kids. <laughs> right? So every time you get a bit of happiness, the next one you think, yeah, I'm gonna get the next one, that's gonna give me more happiness. But then it doesn't. And so guess what? We said, let's have another kid. Two kids surely is better than one kid, right? Wrong. And then you have the second kid and you're like, what have we done? We were so much happier with just one kid. So I reached a point in my life where I was like, okay, this happiness thing hasn't really happened. I wasn't miserable. I certainly wasn't depressed or anything like that. But there was something that was just so unfulfilling about all of that stuff. And then I realized, okay, now I've got to go find some happiness. And guess what? I can't just go and buy something else. I can't accumulate another piece of happiness. I've got to go on a different journey. I've got to look somewhere else. And this is where I think a lot of the world is. This is why I think we're getting a lot of these kind of conversations now. We've reached a point in life now where you can actually comfortably go to any colleagues at work and start talking to them about meditation and mindfulness. They'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I do that. I do that. I do that meditation, mindfulness stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Almost anyone you can talk to these says, oh, I've heard about meditation. I should really try that. Yeah. The question I always get, oh, do you do yoga as well? Always. Always. I'm like, no, there are many different types. But people are so much more accepting of it now. The world has changed. Try and have a conversation with your colleagues at work about God. You didn't just start a conversation about God, did you? Come on, keep that stuff to yourself. Yeah? I say God is almost the biggest swear word these days. You can't actually go up to someone and say, Hi, I'd like to talk to you about God. They're like, What? Get lost. People think you're crazy. The world has changed. We say, Hey, would you like to try some meditation, mindfulness? Oh, it sounds good. The world's changing. And everyone 
is looking for something, but they don't want to be preached to. They don't want to be judged. They don't want to feel like you're drilling some philosophy down their neck, some ideology. So if the whole world is looking for answers, if the whole world is now searching, the question now is where do you find the answers? Where do you go? Everyone's looking, where do you go? Well, I think there are a lot of options these days. There are a lot of options. The number one option tends to be Buddhism. Everyone says, I like that Buddhism. I don't like the other religions, but I like that Buddhism one. They seem to have it right. There's always like very happy. All the pictures of the Buddhists, are they smiling? I'll tell you why they're smiling. They're not married. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't got any kids. It's true. I, I, this is on, my, my honest um, reaction to sometimes I see on, on, on the news and stuff like that. Um, uh, this Buddhist monk is the happiest man in the world. And the scientists have measured these people, like they have checked his brain, this guy's the happiest guy in the world. And I look at it, I'm like, but he's not married. <laughs> Put him in a house, in a job, <coughs> with a wife, with some kids, then tell me how happy you are. Don't tell me about your happiness when you're sitting in a cave somewhere. Yeah? Because that's not my happiness. You're not, how are you going to share happiness with me? And this is not a criticism of, of any other tradition. But let's just look at what, what is being offered to us right now. So the Buddhism is the number one thing. Everyone's like, I like that Buddhist stuff. It doesn't seem to be too intrusive. I can do it in my own time. I don't like the Sikh stuff. There's the hair. There's the whole turban thing. Too much. Right? I don't want it. It seems like too imposing in my life. Give me something simpler. That's why I can do meditation. I just go to a meditation class once a week. Happy. What are your other options? Yoga, of course. Mindfulness retreats. Those are plenty. Yeah? There's no criticism here. We just let's let's talk about what's what's available to us. Meditation apps. How many of you have tried meditation apps? Have you downloaded any? Have you heard of Headspace? Who's heard of Headspace? Who hasn't heard of Headspace? Oh, you gotta try Headspace. It's really interesting. So this British guy becomes a Buddhist monk, goes and learns all the practices and all that sort of stuff, comes back, realizes the whole world needs this meditation stuff. He develops an app called Headspace. He's a billionaire now. And he's created this, and it's actually really good. You can just listen to meditations and anytime you feel a bit stressed, it's like breathe in, breathe out, the graphics are really nice, all that sort of stuff. You can now download spirituality onto your iPhone it's available to you. Maybe you don't have to go to any of these spiritual temples and all these kind of things and, and initiate in a whole religion anymore. I just say, no, there's an app for that now. I don't need anything else. Lifestyle coaches. Have you ever heard of some of these guys? Deepak Chopra, Tony Robbins, Eckhart Tolle. Yeah, great guys. Amazing stuff that they deliver. But look at the options. We have a lot of options. And then you've got the other Scientists who are saying, well, actually, it's all about science. Science will give you all the answers. And some people are saying all of this mumbo jumbo is fine. But actually, in science, and now science is going into like quantum physics and all these kind of things, saying actually, we're discovering, discovering the truth of reality. And so what it means is that everyone is actually looking for a truth. Everyone wants to know what's real. Just give me what is real so that I can know what my life is supposed to be about. So who are you going to go to on your spiritual journey? It's a question you have to ask yourself. And I think it goes back to the cake analogy. You're going to go to someone who you trust, someone who you think has got it figured out. You're going to follow a recipe from someone who's done it before. So who do you trust? Who can you trust? Who do you see as having the most positive impact on people? Now we're talking about how do you decide which spiritual path to follow, because there's so many. One way is maybe you look at who has had the most impact on people. Who's had the most positive impact on people? Who's been doing this stuff for thousands of years? Maybe that's one way of looking at it, compared to some of the very new age spirituality that's coming around. Who treats the symptoms 
And who goes to the root cause of the issue? Maybe that's another way of deciding which spiritual path you're going to go on. Who actually deals with the real root of the issues and who's just making you feel a little bit nice? So this is the beginning of your spiritual journey. And if we look at a spiritual journey, I think it's about finding meaning amongst the mundane. Mundane being the everyday life. We're all living our everyday lives, but all of us are looking for some meaning. We're looking for something that actually feels, yes, this is it. This is the stuff that makes sense. This is where I find my purpose in life. This is where I discover what I'm about. What does it mean to be me? I explain to my children that what I'm teaching is to make your smile bigger. That's all we're trying to do in life. Just make our smile a little bit bigger and we keep it there. So who is going to help you make your smile bigger? How are you going to do it? How are you going to find a way in life that you say, yes, this is what my life is all about. And I think you're going to do it in one way. You're going to ask yourself a very important question. Who is the one going on the journey? Who am I? And this is a very important question. Every spiritual journey has come down to this question. Who are you? Not what you're looking for. Who are you? And this question has been asked by every spiritual seeker because they identify that there's a void inside them. There's something inside them. They say, this is some, there's something uneasy inside me. There's something empty inside me. I feel empty. I feel lost. Nothing seems to give me happiness. So you've got to go and look at what that is. What am I? What is this body? Why do I think the way I think? Why do I act the way I act? What is me? Who are you? So this is where I want you to start answering questions on page six to eight. You've got about 15 minutes. Do you remember that point where I said that I'm going to be listening to you more than you're going to be listening to me? Well, we've reached that point now. So I need a couple of brave volunteers to answer something about themselves. So, a lot of you guys I've never met before. So I want to ask you a question. Let's pretend you and me are in a spiritual conference. No, let's pretend we're in a business conference, right? And I come up to you and I ask you a simple question. Hi, my name is Sathbal Singh. Who are you? What would you say? Who are you? It's not a trick question, by the way. It's a genuine question. Who are you? Hi, I'm Rani. Rani. Nice to meet you, Rani. Who are you? Don't know. It's not a trick question, seriously. Tell me something more about yourself, Rani. Um, I'm 41 years old. I'm a teacher. We're okay. In primary schools. Excellent. Tell me something more. Who are you? I don't actually know. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> well, like I said, this isn't a trick question. Tell me something more about yourself. Um, I like traveling the world. Okay. I like meeting new people. I have two children. Ah, excellent. Thank you. Anyone else? See, it's not difficult. Rani just did it. Tell me something about yourself. I'm Margaret. Um, I'm a counselor. I'm with mental health issues. And I'm a business owner. And a business owner. Excellent. Thank you. See, it's not a drif- difficult question. Anyone else? Tell me something. You've written a lot of stuff down. Tell me some things about you. What else? Who else would like to talk to me? Talk to me. Have you found that spiritual teachings are great to learn, but not always easy to apply to your own life? Sometimes we all need a bit of support and guidance from people who know what we're going through and can help us find some answers. The Nanak Nam Facebook group helps you do just that. It's an online community where you can ask any questions about life and get answers from other members of the group. Search for Nanak Nam Community Support 
and join our free Facebook group today. I'm called Linda, um, I'm from Basingstoke in Hampshire. I'm married, I have no kids. Um, I'm 47 years old and run a dental practice. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. We shall be in touch. <laughs> I need to find a good dentist. <laughs> I tell you why. I tell you why. What my wife does when I'm in that dental chair is she is brutal. She doesn't, she, like, I always think, like, do you treat the rest of your patients, patients like this? And I always feel that there's, like, a little bit of her going, right, now I've got you. <laughs> and so she doesn't, like, warn me about the pain. So she'll just be like, oh, now I'm just going to clean around the back of the teeth. And then it's like, I'm sitting there going, why grow? <laughs> right? And I know she doesn't do that to everyone else. So I think I need a new dentist. I'll come to you. So this really wasn't a trick question. It's not a trick exercise. I want you to tell me what it is that you know about yourself. And what tends to happen is in order for you to start to go on a spiritual journey, a journey of self-discovery, the first thing we have to do is say, well, what do we actually know about ourselves? Like, what do we mean, like, I need to find myself? Have you ever heard that? Like, I need to find myself? If you ever went to your parents and said, mom, dad, I'm going to go to Cambodia. I'm going to sit in a mountain somewhere. I'm going to try and find myself. They'll give you a slap. <laughs> They'll say, I'll tell you where you are. You're right here. Right? Our parents come from a different generation. <laughs> like, you, like, they don't need to find themselves. We need to find ourselves. Right? So, in order to understand who you are, first we need to understand what is it that we know about ourselves. What are the realities that we've created about ourselves? And more often than not, what you tend to know about yourself is actually extremely superficial. Everyone in this room would like to think, actually, I know myself. Like, I, I know a lot about myself. I know who I am. But I'm willing to bet that you don't actually know who you are. The first session, we talked about delusions and what delusions we were going to cover. In the first session, we talked about delusions of God. Like, what is, let's talk about this God thing. In this session, I want to unpack delusions that you have about yourself. And let's see how much you really know about yourself. So... When we try and answer who we are, what we deliver to the rest of the world is a false sense of identities. So, if I ask you who you are, this is the kind of stuff that you're going to tell me. The first thing you're going to tell me is your name. Yeah, we had Rani, we had Amrit, right? We, the first thing we do is like, this is who I am. I'm going to identify myself. It's like my identity number, yeah? Six one four three nine one seven. Uh, that's who I am. I need you to first know my identification. I'm going to give you my name. Sometimes you might give someone your num your 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 gender. Most often than not, it's it's obvious, so you don't need to say it. But you might dress a certain way to make sure that you're clearly identified with that gender. Yeah, you don't want to dress in a way that people don't know what gender you are. So your gender is a part of who, you're ide who you identify with. Then you start telling me about your families. I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I have kids, I don't have kids, I'm all of these sorts of things. You might tell me about your religion. So I'm a Sikh. Maybe you introduce people as I am a Sikh. Sometimes you don't need to, it's staring you in the face. Say, yep, yeah, I know that, I got that, thank you, right? Then you start telling me about what you do. I do this and I do that. I'm a dental nurse, dental assistant. I work in accountancy. I'm a teacher. I'm a this, I'm a that. Yeah? If I dig a little deeper, I'll start asking you about what you like and what you don't like. Yeah? If I start going a little bit further, then you might start saying, I'm a Man United supporter. I'm a Liverpool. No. <laughs> Liverpool? No? Chelsea? Who, who do you support? Man United, okay. And you? Liverpool, of course. Arch rivals. Yeah? So 
once you start giving me your identities, then you start saying things like, oh, I'm a vegan, I'm a this, I'm a that. I never used to be this, but I'm now that. I support this and I don't support that. I, your likes and your dislikes, that's the kind of stuff that you start telling me about. Yeah? Sometimes people get really clever and they say, I'm a human being, by the way. You know? I'm like, duh. Right. Then people get really spiritual. They say, oh, I, I don't know who I am. I'm finding myself. I'm a... I'm a soul, I'm a free spirit, I'm a collection of thoughts. Have you ever heard this one? Um, I'm not a, I never remember it. I'm not a f spiritual being having a physical experience. I'm a, what is it, how does it go? I'm a physical being? No, it's the other way, right? I'm not a, I'm not a physical being having a spiritual experience. I'm a spiritual being having a physical experience. Yeah, that always does my head in. Right? I'm like, what? I'm completely confused. So people start talking about all these things. How many of you start saying, oh, I'm a soul. I'm a spirit. How many of you have a soul? Put your hands up. How many of you have a soul? Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Yep. How many of you have seen your soul? But you're all convinced you have one. Yeah? Never seen it, but I have it. Yeah? Keep it in my back pocket. Right? Well, we all have a soul. None of us know what we're talking about. We just keep waffling on based on what other people will accept. Yeah? And the kinds of conversations we have is different. Yeah? In a spiritual meeting, you can quite comfortably say to me, I don't know who I am. And I say, oh, I get it. I understand. No problem. You can't say that in a business meeting. Someone says, hi, who are you? So I don't know who I am. <laughs> I say, I think you're in the wrong place, mate. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Right? So the kind of answers that we give is dependent on who we think will receive the answer properly. Yeah? So, what exactly is going on? Is this who you are? I'm willing to offer a solution. I'm going to propose to you that you are none of these things. The reason I'm going to propose to you that you are none of these things is because I'm going to ask you, how many of these things did you pick? Let's go through the list. How many of you picked your name? Some people get a chance to do it in a spiritual tradition. If they, if they initiate into a spiritual tradition, then they get given a new name, not necessarily pick their own name. How many of you picked your name? Who picked your name for you? Parents, grandparents, that sort of stuff. Okay? So, is it you? It is how you are identified, but is it you? Or is it how other people chose to identify you? Maybe if you had a choice, you'd pick something else. Maybe that's not the name you want, you want in life. How many of you picked your gender? How many of you chose? Oh, I'm going to be a boy. I'm going to be a girl. It was chosen for you, right? So, I am a man. I am a woman. Well, are you? Or is it just something that's happened to you? How many of you pick your family? How many of you picked your parents? How many of you would like to pick again? <laughs> How many of you picked your community? Your ethnicity? How many of you picked your religion? Very few. Yeah? Then you walk around saying, I am a Sikh. Are you? Or was that done to you? Let's move on. How many of you pick what you like and what you dislike? Let's go back to the football teams. Right. Man United? Why do you support Man United? Huh? Because they're great? Okay. But you picked Man United. Liverpool. How many of you support Liverpool? Anyone else? Why do you support Liverpool? Say again, two of you. Why, why do you support Liverpool? We won it five times. What, at what point did you pick Liverpool? Tell me. Primary school. Did anyone influence you? Was there anyone in your family that was already a Liverpool supporter? No. You picked it yourself. Your friends were Liverpool supporters. I'll tell you a funny story, right? My youngest son goes to um, primary school. 
two brothers. The oldest brother comes home one day and he says to me, Dad, what football team do we support? And I've never been into football much. So I was like, son, I don't, don't really support a football team. So I don't really have an answer to give you. My youngest one, only about four at the time, he says, Dad, if you were to pick a football team, which one would you pick? I said, I don't know, because I don't know anything about football. He said, how would you pick it? He says to me, how would you pick if you were to pick one right now? Oh, that's an interesting question. I said, son, what I would do is I would go and look at the league tables for like the last 10 years, and the ones who've won the most, <laughs> that's why I'm coming to you guys, the ones who've won the most, I'd probably just go with them. They said, wicked dad, let's do that. So we went, we looked at all the league tables, at least for the last 10 years, Man United came out on top. We're like, son, I, I, like, I think I would pick Man United. Done, we all pick Man United. This is why I asked the question about Liverpool, because I went to all of my friends then, right? Guys my age, dads my age, and I had this conversation with them saying, yeah, I think we've picked a team, we're gonna go with Man United. There seems to be this sing thing about Liverpool. All the things were like, no, you can't do that. You gotta stick with Liverpool. And me and my son were like scratching our heads being like, why do they support Liverpool? They're rubbish. <laughs> they haven't won anything in a really long time. I don't understand. And then as I'm asking all of my friends, it turns out in the 80s, they were quite good. <laughs> when they were all young boys, the team was winning quite a lot. And all their brothers and uncles and friends and them lot were saying, yep, Liverpool's the team to stick with. And that stuck with them now. So they're passing it on to their kids. And we're just like, why would I pick a losing team? Makes no sense. So we're all Man United supporters right now. I don't know what that means, <laughs> right? We, we watch nothing, we follow nothing. But if somebody asked, we say, yep, we support Man United. <laughs> My sons have even got the kit now. They know nothing about football. And let's keep it that way. So this is how this stuff works. All right, let's go back to the next one. Occupation. How many of you chose your occupation independently? How many of you are in medicine? Put your hands up, in some sort of medical field. Yes? How many of you were influenced to make that decision? Just one, two, three, four, five, right? Just like I wanted to be a dentist, right? Like why, what? What sane 12-year-old wants to be a dentist? Like of all the cool jobs in the world, that's not the one you're gonna pick, right? Why did, why did I wanna be a dentist? Because my parents just put that idea in me, like, son, that, that's the one you're gonna go for. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, dad. So can you honestly say that the things that you identify with are genuinely yours, independently, uniquely yours? Even your thoughts aren't yours. Perfect example. Our generation can't stand how little care our parents give towards recycling. True or not, our parents couldn't care less about recycling. And they just chucking stuff in all over the place like, what are you talking about? Just put it in the bin. It's rubbish. Put it in the bin. And we're like, no, but dad, the, the, the papers go here and the plastics go here and the food waste go there. What's the difference? Why does, as one generation, we care a lot about it? I tell you why we all care about it, because when I went to school, there was the whole thing called save the planet. Do you remember that whole phrase? We need to save the planet. So in the 80s and the 90s, I grew up thinking, damn, there's something wrong with the planet. We need to save the planet. And now we grow up and we're a lot more conscious and aware. Did they grow up with that kind of messaging, that kind of information? So they're like, what are you talking about? Planet's been here for a long time. I'm sure it's all right. So even our thoughts are not necessarily our thoughts. There's some things that have been programmed into us. We've been conditioned by them. So now we'll very comfortably have an argument with someone because my thought is clearly the right one. And your thought is clearly the wrong one. I'm right, you're wrong. So we start getting into debates and arguments with people about a thought, which if you think about it, probably isn't yours to begin with. So you're fighting to hold on to something that was not genuinely yours. You didn't come up with it. 
Some of them are yours. I'm not saying everything. But in reality, which of these things can you honestly say are yours? So this is how we build an understanding of who we are. I like to talk about the human being as a house. What do you need to build a house? What do you start with? A strong foundation. Without a strong foundation, the whole house is going to fall down. What is your strong foundation? Imagine a house is made of lots of different bricks. And what you do when you're about to build a house is you put the important bricks first, the stuff that cannot move. That's the foundation of who you are. And we do the same thing. The very first brick that we place in the house and the mansion of the self is the name. That's who I am. The very first thing you get given as a, as a child is a name. Nobody calls you baby for the rest of your life. You get given a name so that we can identify which baby are you talking about. And that's the first brick. This is who I am. And from there we start building more and more and more. And the foundation are bricks that are laid that cannot be changed. Most of us don't change our names. Most of us don't change our gender. Most of us. These days everything's possible. But you get your name. The next brick that you put down is, I'm a man. I'm a woman. That's fixed. The next brick you put down is, I belong to this family. I'm never going to be able to change this family. I'm never going to change these parents. That's just who they are. So that's my other thing. I belong to this family. This is who I am. Then we start building a little bit more and more. We start building our foundation of who we are. So then we start looking at things like, this is my occupation. When we, you were young, you weren't always an accountant, a lawyer, a dentist. You weren't a teacher. You weren't all these things. What did you used to say then? I'm a student. You, that was your occupation. That was who you were. So you've got your foundation bricks, and then you've got bricks that can change. So the student brick, you carried that for a really long time. But after a while, you let go of that brick. You say, ah, oh, I'm no longer a student. I give up this brick. Now I'm going to take on a new one. Now I am my profession. This is who I am now. I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. I'm a dentist. I'm a teacher. I'm an accountant. And once you start building this house around you, then you start putting more temporary things like your thoughts, your likes, your dislikes. You start putting things like the things that other people influenced you for. So, you are a Chelsea supporter, Man United supporter, Liverpool supporter. Where did that come from? So we start borrowing bricks from other people. So we say, oh, you're, you're one of those? Oh, okay, I'll do that as well. You're a vegan? That sounds good. I'll do that as well. You're a this, you're a that. I'll start doing all those things. And very quickly, you start building a mansion. Thoughts, ideas, opinions. Opinions is a brick that you can change. Because sometimes you had an idea, but if somebody comes along with a better one, you give up the old one and you say, oh, okay, I get it. I don't hold this idea anymore. I hold another one. But that's still part of your identity. So who you are is just a list of all of these bricks and you hold on to every single one of them. And when somebody comes to say, who are you? You show them all your bricks and say, this is who I am. This is my identity. And when I ask you who you are, you start from the foundation. Oh, I'm this guy. I'm a man. I'm a woman. I'm this person. I'm that person. I give you my name. Then I give you my occupation. Then I give you this. Then I give you my likes and my dislikes. Then I give you my thoughts and my ideas. You start moving up the mansion. And what I'm here to say to you is none of those things are yours. None of those things on the list are yours, none of those things on the list are you. So the question is now, well, who are you? What am I?
Maybe you are something that is behind the bricks. Maybe you are something behind your name, behind your body, behind your ideas, behind your job, behind your associations. Maybe you are something else. The question is, well, what is that? You are what you repeat. I started this morning by asking a question, what life stories do you have? What life mantras are you repeating to yourself? I was very fortunate last year to do an interview with uh, a fascinating lady called Gurpreet Kaur. And she gave me her life story and her battle of dealing with depression for 15 years and suicide. And that video is available on YouTube. Please go and have a look at that. She said something really interesting in that interview. She said to me, my depression became my story. So whenever anyone asked me who I was, I would say, hi, yep, I'm depressed. That's who I am. I'm depressed. I'm a depressed person. That became her story. If that becomes your story, how on earth are you going to get rid of it? When that becomes your identity, how are you going to shake it off? When that's the very thing that you say, I am a depressed person. I am depressed. Not depression is happening to me. I am depressed. You see the difference? You are what you repeat. So let's look a little bit deeper. Because if you don't start understanding yourself, forget your religion. Forget your spirituality. Forget your God. Forget your scriptures. Forget your practices and your meditations. Forget your prayers. Forget your outfit. If you don't ask a fundamental question, what is this? Who am I? What is this thing that is alive? What is the I am? Let's think about this. If you think this is who I am, then what you're saying is I am this body. But we don't talk like that, do we? We say I have a body. We don't say I am the body. We say I have a body. I have a hand. I have legs. I have eyes. We don't say, I am the eyes. I am the ears. I am the face. We say, I have them. My question is, if you have them, then who has them? Who is it that has the body? It's like when you're driving a car. You're inside the car, right? You don't say, I am the car. You say, I have a car. I am inside the car. And right now, you would say, I am inside my body. Unless some of you are having an out of body experience, in which case, please come and tell us. Because there was something in that coffee. If you're having an experience of being inside the body, then what is that? What's inside the body right now? If your body wasn't here, what would be left? Remember, I'm talking about you. I'm not talking about philosophy here. I'm not talking about theory. I want you to ask yourself a question. What is this? Who am I? What is this thing? Where does the I am exist? Let me ask an easier question. When you're sad, where does the sadness exist? Is it in your foot? You say, my foot is sad. Where does the sadness exist? In your heart? You say, my heart is sad, my heart is broken. Yeah. In your soul? Who's experiencing something? It's in the mind. It's a thought. I am sad. I am depressed. I am unhappy. Where does that exist? It exists as a thought. A thought comes up. 
And if I ask you, how do you feel? You wait for that thought to give you an answer. The thought says, I feel good, say that. You say, I feel good. So where is that thought coming from? We have a tendency to think that everything that pops in our minds is true and is correct. You agree? Everything that pops into our head, we think, yep, that sounds good. I'll do that. It's true. You get up in the morning, I want to have some toast. Yep, that sounds good. I'll do that. Yeah? I want to wear this today. I want to wear that. Thoughts are firing off in your brain and you say, yes, yes, master. Yeah? The mind is the master. And we say, yes, okay. My question is, is everything that your brain comes up with true? Is everything that your mind tells you accurate? Simple example. How many of you can go downstairs in the middle of the night when it's completely dark? No? How many of you struggle? How many of you struggle to look out of a window when it's pitch black? Yeah? But there's nothing there. You know there's nothing there, right? But there's a part of you that says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go down there. So you tremble and you walk down and you try and put the light on. Oh, God, there's nothing here. What was all of that? It was a fear. So your mind said, be careful. But was it a reality? So not everything that pops into your head is actually true. Where am I going with this? There's something else that's inside your head. And the Guru has given a very unique word. And that word is ha me. Me, me. The best translation, the best way to translate the word ha and me is me, me. Possibly the most accurate English word of ha me is myself. The me, me, this bit, myself, not ego, not pride, but me. And that me is something that's happening inside you. All of you have this feeling of me, I amness. And this I amness occurs inside every single human boy, human mind. And this I amness is the way in which you look at the world. So we all look at the world through this lens and the lens is I am. So I look at stuff and I say, is this good for the me or is this bad for the me? And that's how I deal with everything and every person that I come into contact with. I look at a piece of food. Is this good for me or is this bad for me? Is this safe or is this unsafe? Is this person going to be good to me? Or is this person going to be bad to me? So we look at the whole world through the lens of I am. That's how we decide how to deal with the world through this I amness. Is it going to be good for me? Or is it not going to be good for me? Is it going to work? Or is it going to harm me? So the me is the central character of your life story. Agree with that? Your life story revolves around something called me. The me, the I am. My question is, what is that? And this I am is the cause of a lot of problems. What it does is it creates a separation. I am, me means I am not you. I'm not you. I'm me. I'm not there. I'm here. Does that make sense? The I am is this guy, not that guy. So the separation is caused by the I am. Think about the question we had before the last break. I felt the oneness, but I don't know how to stay in the oneness. Something is stopping me from staying in the feeling of oneness all the time. Gurbani tells you that this feeling of I amness is your problem. And the feeling of I amness 
causes some other emotions, some other thoughts. So the I am says, I want, I like, I don't like, I love, I hate. That's mine, that's not mine. And the Guru has identified all of these. We can call these five defects. We can call them five states of mind. But these are naturally occurring. So we're not trying to demonize them. They are naturally occurring. And the Guru calls them Kaam, Krodh, Lob, Moh, Hankar. I want. This is mine. I need. I'm important. This belongs to me. I am better than you. All of those statements are I am statements, but they come from an I am first. And what we've done with spirituality is we've started teaching people how to deal with these symptoms and not to deal with the root cause of the problem. So we go on a spirituality retreat and said, I got to deal with my anger issues because I get a bit angry all the time. Yeah. And everyone says, oh, sure, I can help you deal with your, uh, your anger. Do this mudra, do this, do that. Take this, drink this tea for 40 days, do all these things. Right? This is why I said to you, who do you trust goes to the root of the problem and who is dealing with the symptoms? The guru is dealing with the root of the problem. The root of the problem is there is an I am who is getting angry. If you get rid of the anger, you haven't got rid of the I am, tomorrow the, uh, the anger can come back because the I am is still there. Yes? Right. Close your eyes. Sit up straight. Start by listening to your breathing. And I want you to just become aware of your thoughts. Just become aware of which thoughts enter your mind. Try not to get carried away by one particular thought. Just become aware which thoughts enter your mind. See the images being formed in your mind. See the words. See the pictures that are coming into your mind, whatever you're thinking about. Good. Now bring your awareness back to your breathing. And when you're ready, open your eyes. Now, this is the fun bit. What did you think about? Anyone would like to share with me what you thought about? Keep it clean. <laughs> so I thought, I haven't got any thoughts. Okay. But then towards the end I realized that isn't my thought. So you had a thought saying, I don't have any thoughts. And then you realized, oh, that's a thought. Excellent. I like that. I like that. Thank you. What did you think about? One here. Thinking of a bird. Okay, thought of a bird. And I had a picture of an Instagram. A picture of a bird, yes. And I thought, very beautiful. And then I went beyond the bird into a meadow. And I was like thinking about what this one thing would be doing with the scenery. Excellent, excellent. Yes, what did you think about? So initially there were no thoughts, and then um, as you were speaking, those manifested into my thoughts. Um, and then um, at the point where you said visualize something, I imagined myself in the outdoors. Okay. In the but what was really peculiar was that um, I started to see the sky, even though I wasn't looking at the sky, I was looking more towards the ground. And I realized what I was looking at was, um, it was like a puddle of water, which was reflecting. Reflection in the sky. Excellent. Okay. What else did you guys think about? Let me ask you some questions. How many of you thought about family members? 
Hands up. Keep your hands up. How many of you thought about family members? How many of you thought about some responsibility that needs to be done, some work or some action that needs to happen soon? How many of you thought about food? Good? It's usually the guys, yeah. It's close to lunchtime. Okay. You thought about your cold. Okay. Now let me ask you a very important question. How many of you chose to think about those things? How many of you made an active choice? I'm going to sit here. I'm going to think about my family member. I'm going to think about work. I'm going to picture a meadow. I'm going to picture nature. I'm going to think about food. Or how many of you can say that a thought just popped into my head? Yes? Realistically, a thought just popped into my head? Now answer this question. Are you the creator of that thought? Or did the thought happen to you? Are you the creator of the thought? Or are you the receiver of that thought? These are your thoughts, yeah? Our thought, my thoughts, my opinions. Do you create them? Are you the owner of that thought? Can you take ownership of that thought? then my question is, what on earth is going on inside your head? I tell you what's going on. It happens to all of us. The way I like to talk about it is like a firework display. Stuff is just happening. It's just happening. One after the other. You don't know what size, what color, what thing is going to come up next. Your brain is just somehow making or receiving randomness, absolute randomness all the time. And somewhere inside all of those thoughts is another thought that says, yep, mine, mine, yes, mine. I agree with that one. Yep, that's mine. Yep, yep. Oh, that one's mine. Oh, I haven't thought about that for a while. Yep, mine. You are taking ownership of stuff that is nothing to do with you. You are not choosing any of this stuff, but you're taking ownership of it. Let me give you another example. How many of you have stood on a train station and there are other passengers there and you've had this thought. I wonder if that person falls down, what it'd be like. <laughs> be honest. How many of you have thought about, what if I push that person? Right? There's, right? Am I the only one? Yeah, you're also looking around to make sure. Because you had the thought. You're like, I hope nobody else is going to, nobody's not going to push me. Right? I've had that thought. My question is, did I choose to have that thought or did it just pop into my head? I can't take ownership of that thought, can I? I can take a responsibility and say, right, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to listen to that. Right? Most of the time we choose. Yeah? But maybe we don't choose. Maybe there's another part of us that says, yeah, I don't think you should do that. And that's just another thought. At which point is there a decision maker about the thought? Let's try a second experiment. Okay, sit up straight. Close your eyes. Now I want you to imagine yourself lying on a beach. Now, I want you to imagine yourself walking through a beautiful garden. Now, I want you to think about yourself in a supermarket. 
pushing a shopping trolley, loading the, the baskets. Now I want you to remember a positive memory of a birthday party, your birthday, celebrating with family or friends, Now, I want you to gently open your eyes and look around the room as though you're having a dream and just everything that you're looking around, just look around from left to right. See it as though you're observing this room as a dream. Okay, bring yourself back into the room. What is, in all of those memories or thoughts or imaginations, what is the one consistent experience throughout all of them? Uh, there's a guy in the back like, watching. There's a guy in the back watching? Yeah. Okay. So there is this sense of I amness. Yes. They're all happening in your head? Yep. It's an extension of birth. Yep. You, you're, there's, there's a central character, there's you. There's someone watching all of those memories, yeah? Now the interesting question is that you now start to realize that there are thoughts, there are memories, there are imaginations, there are pictures in your head, and then there's someone watching those pictures. There's someone having those thoughts. There's someone who is separate from the thought. A recent study has shown that over 75% of Sikhs say that their life feels stressful or overwhelming. These feelings can develop into depression, alcohol abuse, or even suicide. We believe that Guru Nanak's wisdom can help transform people's lives. Nanak Nam relies on your donation to help create more videos and podcasts like this to educate people all over the world on how to use Guru Nanak's teachings to improve their emotional, mental and spiritual well-being. Set up a monthly donation today and help change someone's life. Visit nanaknam.org forward slash donate. So we start to realize that there's something inside of us that's alive. There's something inside of us that's awake. My question is, what is that that is inside of you that is awake? Let me ask you a, a simpler question. What's the difference between you and a dead person? Sounds like a punchline, but it isn't. What's the difference between you and someone who's dead? You're breathing, what else? Conscious, you're aware? I simplify it a bit more because I'm not a medic. I simplify it in a way that says if there's a dead body here and an alive body here, what is the difference between the two? The dead body seems to be switched off and the alive person seems to be switched on. Like the same body, the same eyes, ears, nose, heart, lungs, they're all there, but with, between me and him, something seems to be switched off in them and something is switched on inside you. What is switched on inside you? What is it? What do you have? Something, isn't it? It's some sort of energy, soul, aliveness. You have some aliveness inside you. There's something going on inside you, isn't there? I give a really example, a simple example that I use with my kids. I say to my kids, if you take a remote control toy or any electronic toy, if I take the batteries out, would you expect it to work? They say, no, of course it can't work. And you put the batteries in and it seems to work and it seems to move and do stuff on its own. Yeah? I said, what is making you alive? What is the battery inside you? What's keeping you alive? What is it that when you die, gets taken out? Nothing gets taken out from you. There were even 
experiments that were, that were done by scientists where they tried to define, does the soul have any weight? Like when a dead person dies, does anything actually leave? But most of us will say that from a dead to an alive state, nothing actually changes. But something very clearly does change. Something switches off. What is that? What do you have inside you right now that you don't even know about? Something is happening inside you and we don't know what it is. What are you left with? Let me ask you another question. If I take your arm off, are you still you? You'll be very angry with me, but you're still you. If I take the other arm off, are you still you? If I take one leg, the other leg. If you're still alive, you're still there. You're still you. If we now go and take everything away from you, what do you get left with? It's tricky, isn't it? What are you left with? You might conclude, there's a me. I don't know what it is, but there's a me inside me. I'm here. And then I'll ask you, where is that me? Where are you inside your body? Are you in your hand? Are you in your chest? Are you in your mind? Where are you? Most of us are experiencing life from around here somewhere. We're not seeing the world through our knees or through our elbows. We're experiencing the world, our consciousness is somewhere around here, the brain or whatever you want to call it. Now, what the most interesting thing is, even today, neuroscientists can't figure out what consciousness is. They just don't know. Neuroscientists are debating, does the brain create consciousness or does the brain receive consciousness? Why, Guru? <laughs> Trying to give me an answer. Neuroscientists can't figure it out. Are you alive? Well, if you're alive, what is alive? They don't know. So we, we are part of something that we don't know what's going on. And if you don't know what makes you alive, what on earth do you know about yourself? Very little. All you can say is, I exist, I'm here. And that one single thing is what the Guru calls Ha Me, I am. We all know that we have it, but we can't describe it. But there is an I am that's here. And the Guru says the I am is the biggest problem that we all have naturally. And that is the biggest barrier. But if I start asking you, well, what are you? You can say, well, I'm not my name. I'm not my body. I'm not my occupation. I'm not my head or my legs. I was going to say, or my tail. I'm not any of those things. I'm not my job. I'm certainly not my family. I might have children. I might have parents. I might have brothers and sisters, a husband and wife. But I don't become that. Is they're just things that I have. It feels a bit like this. Like there is a something inside me and then there's a whole bunch of stuff that's outside me. But there is a me that's at the center of all of this stuff. My question to you is, well, what is that me? Who am I? Now, you may not be able to answer this question about who you are, but the gurus and the spiritual masters have come with a solution. They said, you know this I am? There's a way of living without it. And most of us have never even considered that as an option. We've never considered that there's a way to live without this driver inside the car, this feeling that I am, the one that feels like he owns the body, the one that feels like he owns the thoughts, there's a way to switch that off. And why would you want to do that? Because that I am is causing every single problem in your life. 
every sadness, every bit of suffering, every pain, every hurt, every hard memory, every difficult experience is happening to that I am and we can deal with it. Let's see what the Guru says. The Guru says, Manmuk dukh ka khet hai, dukh bije dukh khai. You are like a field of suffering. You plow in suffering and of course suffering grows. Dukh vich jamme dukh mare. You are born into suffering and you seem to live your whole life in suffering and then you die suffering. Homme karat vihai. And this I am is what you live with your whole life. The Guru is saying, I live with this I am the whole life. Look what the Guru says. Home vada rog hai. It is a massive disease that you have inside you. We all have it. But you know what? It doesn't feel like a disease. Does it? Feels like me. Me, I am. I, I like myself. I'm okay with myself. I don't want to get rid of myself. What are you talking about? The Guru is saying, I don't want you to get rid of yourself. But you want to get rid of all your suffering in your life, don't you? Well, the suffering isn't the problem. The one having the suffering is the problem. Let's look at that. The Guru says, Home vada rog hai bhai, duje, pae duje karam kamai. Because of this I am, you create a separation. And you do everything in this separation. Everything is happening. Me against you. Me versus you. Do I like you? Do I not like you? This is how you function. Most people don't understand that the Guru actually talks about this stuff. It's talking about you and how you function in the world. So there is a me. And I can't describe it. The me isn't the one who is having the suffering. The me is just experiencing suffering. And over time, we can start seeing that there is a barrier between me and it. You think that you're the driver of your body. You think that you're the driver of your life. But when we start asking who is that driver, we start getting confused. I don't know. I don't know who that driver is. Life just seems to be happening. In reality, I'm not doing very much. Let me give you a simple example. You stand in front of a choice. The choice is tea or coffee. Who makes that decision? What is the process by which that decision gets made? You're looking at tea and coffee. I'll tell you what happens. An answer pings in your head and it says coffee and you go and get the coffee. Did you choose the coffee or did coffee come as the answer? It just comes, coffee, I'm gonna pick coffee. There is no decision maker inside you. There's just stuff happening, goes back to the fireworks example. And the more that you search and look for yourself, you realize you can't find yourself. You cannot find the I am inside you. And this is what all the spiritual teachings have tried to do. The I am that you have inside you is not actually real. What is real? That stuff seems to just be happening. There's an aliveness inside me. It seems to be there and it seems to be happening without my control. When you realize that there is no you, you start to realize that life seems to be happening without a you inside. There's no real hatred inside you. Hatred is an idea, but there is a you that's separate from hatred. Love is an idea, but there is a you that's separate from it. Time is an idea that you're separate from it. Your body, you are separate from it. So what is this thing that's inside you? The Guru says it's this. Who knows what that is? Most of you. The Mool Mantar. Most of us have looked at the Mool Mantar as a description of God. 
but maybe the mool mantra is a description of you. There is something that's just on inside you. Ik, there's a oneness that's just alive inside you. It's onkar, it's happening. Satnam, it exists. It does everything. I'm not doing anything, which me is doing something. It doesn't actually have any fear. It doesn't actually have any hate. The aliveness inside you, does it hate anyone? Or is hatred a thought that your aliveness can see? It's starting to get a bit confusing, a bit deep, huh? A bit too deep before lunch. What does this all mean? Let's bring it all right back. What does it all mean? It means that there is a oneness inside you, but you don't know how to access it. There is something inside you that you don't know about. And this is what a spiritual journey is all about. There is a separation inside you that you don't know why it exists. Why don't I feel like the oneness? Why don't I feel it? We don't know, we don't understand our own selves. And this is the spiritual journey, that you can find this stuff. And this is when you start to discover that you are not separate from the ocean. You are part of the ocean. Remember that analogy. I'm going to leave you with a very simple understanding. Most of life has happened to you and you're not happy with it. And then you go on a spiritual journey. You go on a spiritual journey and you're saying there's a me and then there's a God. And I have to somehow connect with this God. Yeah? I have to somehow merge with this God so that me and God somehow become one entity. And I don't know why that doesn't happen. The reason that me and God don't connect is because there's something stopping you. And it's right in front of you. Your sense of I am is stopping you. So you know when you go on your spiritual journey and saying, I'm going to find God? You know why you'll never find God? Because the I am is looking for God. The thing that makes you separate from everyone else is your barrier. That is the reason why you will never find God. Because the I am is looking for God and I am can never find God. Is this what the Guru teaches? Let's find out. There's a Shabbat, a beautiful Shabbat. Bhagat Ravidas Ji. He says, Jab hum hote, tab tu nahi. When I exist, you don't exist. I can't find God. Ab tu hi, main nahi. Now that I've found you, I realize I don't exist. The process of a spiritual journey is not to find God. The process of a spiritual journey is to understand the I am and to realize that it doesn't exist. The I am is what Gurbani is trying to deal with, not you trying to find Mr. God. And when you realize that you aren't the doer of your own life, you'll start to talk like the gurus have talked. Guru Nanak Dev Ji says, Katata bakata sunata soe aap bichare so gyani hoy. The one who is speaking, the one who is listening, the one who is thinking is this oneness. And when you find and search for yourself, then you are spiritually enlightened. Aap bichare, one who goes and searches for himself, is spiritually enlightened. Guru Nanak Dev Ji, Tat Niranjan Jyot Sabai, So Hang Ped Na Koi Jiyo. Tat Niranjan Jyot. Guru Nanak says, there is an essence of divine light in the whole of the universe. So Hang, that's who I am. I am the divine essence of the whole universe. This is how Guru Nanak talks about himself. He says, I am that. Not I am Nanak or I am this body or I am me. He says, I am the very essence of the whole universe. Pe the nakoi jiyo. There is no difference between me and the essence of the universe. You are God. The question is, 
when will you realize? So the question was just about how do we find um, a way to move on to the next level? How do we take an understanding and then make it something that we're actually experiencing? And it's very similar to the, the question that we had before, that you may have had glimpses of, of, of an understanding or an experience, but there isn't necessarily that, that sustained experience of it. And this is where, this is where the requirement, this is where it needs you to have a practice that takes the wisdom from a this is where you need to have a practice where it takes the wisdom from an intellectual into an experiential you need to find a way where no longer is oneness a concept in your head but it's a feeling that you feel and when you feel something when you've known an experience of something, then it doesn't require somebody else's description. So it's like you hearing a talk on the experience of love. And then you say, well, how do I feel that love? How do I get to that point where I'm experiencing that love? Well, there's two ways to, to, to answer that. One is that you don't decide. It's actually when your time is right, when you fall in love, you fall in love. When you find love, when you find someone to love, all of that stuff just seems to happen. Nobody decides that they're going to fall in love. And in the same way, you can't decide that you're going to experience this oneness. You can try and understand it, but you can't decide that you're going to feel it. But then on the other hand, this isn't something about an external thing. This is about yourself. So you can then start to look within yourself and say, what about me can I connect with a oneness? Rather than how do I feel a oneness as though a oneness is something external to you, what part of the oneness do I have? How do I feel when I look at a rainbow? How do I feel when I see the sunrise? How do I react when it's raining? Can I create a level of acceptance, tolerance, peace within me that means that I'm not waiting for something else? So it comes down to a practice. You can't just wait for these things to happen. You can actually have a spiritual practice. This is why theory only goes so far. This is why we combine meditation with the wisdom. So meditation is probably the quickest way for you to start to experience some of these things. And anyone who's experienced these things, either in meditation or in kirtan or in sitting in a darbar and just listening to the Guru's words in a hukumnama, there's no limit to how you can experience these things, but there is a decision that you can make that actually prioritizes it in your life. And I think that's, that's probably the first thing you need to do is to actually make this a priority in your life. And when you start to make things a priority in your life, your life is just going to start navigating slowly and slowly in that sort of direction. So one, it's grace if it happens. Two, there are things that you can do and meditation is my closest experience that I've had is, is in experiences of meditation. So now you've got to ask yourself, well, am I, am I doing that? Am I? And I don't mean the very external sort of, I just go to the Gurdwara and I just say a few things or I do a few things. No, do you actually find a stillness within yourself? Do you, do you have a practice that makes you find a peace within yourself? And if the answer is no, then you've come to the right place because we're going to be covering that straight after this. Yeah? Brilliant. Um, any more? We're going to cover tomorrow a lot to do with how do you practically apply this, um, which is in the third lecture that we've called uh, Overcoming Obstacles. But... I, I would go back to the same answer that I gave to the last question. This is not something you apply. This is not a idea 
that you conceptually have to remind yourself, oh yeah, I must look at this from a oneness perspective. This is not that. You have to have started to lose yourself. And let me, let me, I mean, I go back to the love example because I think love is the closest experience that you will have to what the gurus are talking about. And I'll, 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 give, you, I'll give you an example. When I, um, and anyone who's watched the, um, the Life Talk episode that I did recently with my wife uh, on YouTube, I, I, I touched upon this, this idea. When, when, when I first um, started going out with her and, 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 and we were in that sort of very early honeymoon period of kind of falling in love and, and, and really starting to um, spend all of our time thinking about each other the whole process of initially falling in love. I remember one morning waking up and I was just sitting in my room and this is before we were married. I was not even in, um, we weren't living together or anything like that. I was in my parents' house. I woke up and sat in my bed one morning and I physically couldn't see the distinction between me and her in my own feeling. I couldn't, I was like, I, I could feel that her and me were, were, were occupying this body. And that, scared me a little bit, worried me. I'm like, what on earth is going on? I'm not talking to her, I can't see her, she's not in front of me. But I could feel a second person was occupying this space that I called just me. Before this was just me. And I genuinely for the first time started to experience what it felt like to lose yourself. To lose who you actually Ah, oh, the very feeling of what it feels like to be me, I actually started to feel like I don't feel like a me anymore. I feel like something different. I feel like the me before I was with this person was an individual. Now I feel like I'm a, I'm a half of, of, of a partnership. Now, you have to have experienced something like that in order to now know what love is. You can't logically explain these things you can't apply these things but now when you know love i can feel love towards other people because i know what the radiance of love is inside me i can feel love towards strangers not that i do it all the time but there are times where i can feel it i can be in a state where i can look at strangers look at children look at adults look at terrorists look at the worst people in the world and there's a love inside me do you see that that's not applying anything? I'm not trying to apply. I'm not reminding myself, no, you've got to love everyone. It's, it's something that spontaneously starts to happen. And so these are the kinds of experiences that are available to you through a meditative practice. And, and, I, and, I, and I openly say, if there's one experience I want every single human being to experience is, is falling in love. You genuinely cannot come close to any other, nothing else comes close to falling in love. And when you start to fall in love, there isn't this idea that I have to apply this knowledge. And so this is why it's very important that we don't take everything that we're covering today as just being a, a concept. Yep, I get it, I went, I heard this, those talks, I get it. Like, but I don't get it, I don't feel it. So I don't want you to feel disheartened being like, well, this guy is talking about these very kind of wide concepts, but I'm not there. At least you're being introduced to these concepts. You know, there are 7 billion people on this planet. And the, the, the biggest tragedy of this planet is they're not introduced to what Guru Nanak had to teach them. And you are. So at least you have the opportunity now to say, right, I can see that there's a direction that I need to go in. There's a direction that I need to head towards. And maybe I can start working towards that. Tomorrow we're covering two sessions. One is how do we overcome obstacles? How do we deal with difficulties? But then the final session is how do we develop spiritually? So we are going to be covering all of these kind of things. How do I actually practically get to the next level? So we're going to be covering all of those things. I'm really looking forward to some of those. Don't go ahead and look at the slides. They'll give all the answers away. Yes. You know, a bit challenging when we think about the concept of oneness is in relation to good and bad. Yes. And how it relates. Is it something that's from the mind side that we bring to the world, or is it something that's inherent to oneness? So, uh, have a good discussion about that with the great people that elaborate. You see, if we look at the oneness concept, the very nature of the number one is that it's not two. 
And the very nature of one means that there are no opposites. And good and bad is the epitome of opposites. It is the epitome of dividing things, splitting them up. And I've now stopped using the words good and bad in my life. And I now prefer to see things as things that are preferential and things that are not preferential to me as an individual. <coughs> because when we talk about things that are good and bad, we state them like they're universal truths. So somebody kills a innocent child. We say it as bad, like that's a, that's a universal truth. There is no way that that's good. There's nothing good about it. It's only bad. It's unanimously agreed that that's bad. But when we talk about things as good and bad in that way, what we do is we create a very easy scapegoat. That guy is bad. And in doing so, what we do is we also make ourselves slightly feel be better. What we're saying is if I can label you as bad, I can label me as good because I'm not doing what you're doing. And so you, by labeling someone bad, you create a duality. You create a distance between me and them. And what we need to start doing is starting to understand how did this happen? Why did it happen? What is it that led that person to do that horrible act? Because they weren't doing things to be the bad guy. Nobody does anything to be the bad guy. People do things because they feel that they're, they're entitled to do it. That's the right thing for them to do. Now, that doesn't excuse the horrible things that happen in life. That doesn't mean that we sit back and we just let whatever happens, happens. But when we start to create goods and bads, ups and downs, what we're doing is we're creating a split personality within ourselves. I'm only going to do the good things. And by doing that, you're negating a section of, of your own self, which is, which is that you have the capacity to do bad things as well. We all have the capacity to do bad things. We may choose not to do them, but we are creating a devil within us. We're creating a feeling that there's negativity in us and there's positivity. And that's why this, this sort of terminology is very destructive. It doesn't help you at all. And hopefully in tomorrow's session, we'll go through so many examples where you can start to see how do we practically apply the good and the bad. What other questions came up in some of the discussions? I was just grateful. Um, we initially spoke about the <coughs> idea and concept of oneness being very refreshing to people, um, considering stereotypically we've been trained to think a different way ever since we've been younger, um, looking externally for God, for that peace and love, that more searching, as opposed to looking within mm -hmm. and doing the connectedness within us all. Um, so we were just discussing how we can implement that on a daily practice, which will be coming tomorrow. Um, we also spoke about the element of how can we address somebody who's being emotionally challenging or tough relationships and conveying that concept of oneness be back in with your emotions and how to kind of differentiate between those two. Yeah. Um, so almost the same question every time. How do I do, how do I live this? How do I live in this in this in this oneness? And um, one interesting um, question was: We're in Sikhi. We're taught to um, from the person who asked question that we achieve mukti after you die, mm. and the whole point is to live the life so that we become one and merge when we die. But what about when we're living? This is a, a question that came up a couple of times, which is, well, if life is a oneness, what is my purpose here? What do I do? Surely I'm still trying to be a good person. Surely I still want to find God when I die and I merge with God. Unfortunately, this is a concept that has crept into a spiritual tradition such as 
the non-dual traditions such as Gurmat, that there is a reward at the end of death. And we've even started to use some very Western terminology to apply to some very Eastern concepts. So we talk about reincarnation and we talk about escaping reincarnation almost as the same way as we do with reincarnation is hell and escaping reincarnation is heaven. And essentially what we're trying to do is trying to get away from heaven, away from hell and, and into heaven. And the gurus took away some of that way of thinking and what they were trying to get us to understand is that there is a way for you to be liberated now. Almost all spiritual traditions are trying to get you liberated after death. And the gurus were saying, well, why do I want to be liberated after death? I, I have a solution now. And so they called that idea Jivan Mukt, being dead and alive at the same time, being liberated but being involved with the world at the same time. I am part of this world, but I'm also free from it. So freedom is something that we are going to experience now. It isn't a question of being a good person so that when you die, God sees that you've ticked all the right boxes. It's about finding God now. And I think one of the most important lessons is that if you don't find God now, you're not going to find God when you die. And so that's something that we need to start changing the way we think. That being liberated now from our sorrows, being liberated now from troubles in our life, being liberated from our sense of self-importance, that's the freedom that you have available to you through this spiritual path you have these opportunities open to you you have a way of living life that is available to you which is about you having a better life now not a better life after you die in fact if you have a great experience of life now one which is free then you have freed yourself from even the bondage of death. And the Guru talks about time and time again that I am free from death. Death cannot touch me. And if you reach the state where you're free from death, then where is the question of you becoming free after death? If you're so disconnected from your mind, you're disconnected from your body, you're disconnected from this as being your only identity, and you identify with the universe. There is a beautiful phrase, which is from the Upanishads, which is very ancient um, scriptures from India. And it, it says, Aham Brahmasmi, I am the universe. I am one with the universe. And one of the quotes that I used in the previous lecture, Tat Niranjan Jot Sabai Soham, Soham is a beautiful word. I am that. They say that there is a cry that a baby does when it's first born. The baby cries when it's first born and the sound is almost like Koham, Koham, what am I, what am I? And when the universe breathes life into it, the reply from the universe is Soham, you and me are one, you are me. So man is born into the universe with this big question, who am I? But when you understand that you are the universe, that is your liberation. That is your freedom. And you are now no longer capable of dying. And it doesn't mean that your body doesn't die. Your body will die, but you won't die because you are no longer tied down to the identity with the body. You are no longer the body, you are no longer the mind. You are the universe. And the universe cannot die. Everything physical can die, but the essence of the universe cannot die. So that is what it means to be liberated. That is the mukti that you get now 
to the point at which even when your body goes, you will not go. So we have to completely get away from this idea that when I die, I will be liberated. 